Yeah, we are one minute past one on this lunchtime, so we'll we'll get going um, for today's roundtable uh, around neurodiversity in sports and accessibility and inclusion uh, within that area as well. Um, just to get the logistical sort of side of things over and done with, nice and quickly. My name's Simon. I'm the uh, director and founder of the Coach, and just to give you a bit of a background around these roundtables and us. Um, eCoach is an organisation that works within that kind of online education sphere for sports organisations and Accelerate Sports is our arm that works around EDI okay. training and education. I myself, I come from a background of, uh, I worked at Show Racing Red Card and numerous sort of um, EDI focused charities for a number of years before setting up um, eCoach and Accelerate Sports. So we offer training and online online training webinars and face-to-face -face sessions around um Increasing inclusivity, really, in um, engaging um, different audiences uh, for sports across the UK. Um, and we've done these roundtables, really. We've been doing them for a little while, but we've really pushed on in 2024. And there's a couple of reasons for that. We've got a number of courses coming out, and the roundtables tend to link in with that. Um, at the moment, we've got 12 courses live, and we've got another four or five over the next few weeks. But also, you're probably aware that we would expect in 2024 to, for there to be quite severe cuts uh, across the board for NGBs, for sports, for governing bodies, for the sports councils as well. And from conversations I've had, generally the biggest cuts or the, the cuts like that would generally see EDI and and that sort of element of, of sport being pushed to the side first above other things. So unfortunately, over the next maybe year or so, I think um, even though we all, you know, the sports and NGBs will say that they they're, they're pushing EDI it'll be, become something that's is, is I think probably siphoned to the side slightly so this is our little effort to keep that conversation going bring people together in a safe base to have those conversations around around engagement um etc and hopefully you know it'll be um a useful experience for everyone here it's very much a case of having an hour we're only really able to scratch the surface of what we're talking about today but it is a, a chance to, to start that conversation. And hopefully it's a conversation and that can potentially continue offline amongst different sports and be really interesting today as well to hear from the different sports within the room. If they've got any questions. If you've got any questions and you, you want to ask our experts today who we'll be introducing shortly, then this is a great opportunity to do that. But also if you've got some examples of good practice that you'd like to share across the sporting industry, we'd be really interested to hear from, from you on that front as well so just to touch on the sort of logistical side of it today is being recorded so um you can probably see that and you would have got a message when you came in so it will be then shared over the next uh, 24 hours out to you as well so you can feel free to share it with anyone within your organization who you think might find it interesting um and if you have to leave early etc you can obviously uh, refer to the recording tomorrow and catch up with anything that you uh, might have missed as well so i'm presenting today i'm just um Basically, my job is to press buttons and make sure everything works fairly well because I have no expertise in this area whatsoever. Um, but at Accelerate Sport, what we try and do is work with experts and we create learning and online uh, training content in partnership with people that have lived experience and, and have expertise in certain areas. And we brought together a really great panel, we think, today to have this sort of discussion with you. Rather than me jumping in and sort of introducing introducing them I thought it probably best to introduce them one by one and maybe they can sort of tell you about their experience within this area um, and why they're here today and as I said at the beginning we're, we're launching a um, neurodiversity inclusivity um, course in the coming week or two and we work with Lucy Wells who you can see on your screen there on the uh, left hand side neurodiversity occupational therapist and author to create that again we're looking to partner with experts in the fields so Lucy welcome along today if you can just uh, tell us a little bit about your background, that would be great. Hi, everybody. It's lovely to see so many people here. Um, so, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an occupational therapist um, and not everybody's really aware of what OTs or occupational therapists do. So um, we, we basically we try and help people to maintain their health and well-being through the activities they do in life. So occupation doesn't just mean job, it means any activity. Um, so 
I've worked, I worked in the NHS for nearly 20 years, mainly in adult mental health services, but I then became more of a specialist in um, clients who are neurodivergent um, and helped set up um, the Sheffield Adult Autism Service and also the Cardiff and Vale Integrated Autism Service. And I now work privately as a consultant OT, specifically for adults who are neurodivergent and have mental health problems. Um, so for me, the, the sport is wonderful. Uh, you know, over the years of my career, um, I've helped lots of my clients to access sports as a way of increasing their mental health, physical health and overall well-being. Um, Personally, I was one of those kids who was absolutely terrible at school, uh, at, school at sport, um, partly because I have visual problems um, and coordination problems, um, and partly because my PE teacher didn't see that at all and just thought I was being lazy or like just a bit rubbish. So was very, very critical and difficult. So I know what it feels like to be one of those people who's picked last for the team um, and struggles. And I think actually that doesn't need to happen anymore in this day and age. Kids who are different, adults who are different, should be welcomed and supported and helped define their strengths and their qualities and skills. Because I think that there's a sport out there for pretty much anybody, but it's about matching people to what suits their, um, their skills and their strengths. Um, so I was approached by eCoach to help co-author their latest um, online course, which is all about um, how you can support people who are neurodivergent to access sports effectively and how to be um, more inclusive and supportive of people's needs. To be honest, I think this is stuff we need to think about for everybody. I don't think it just is, you know... Um, uh, restricted to having a diagnosis I think you know everybody's different and if we could be more inclusive and accepting across the board that would help everybody so that's why I'm here that's who I am Fabulous. thank you very much uh, Lucy we'll come back to you uh, at the start of the the first kind of point in question I think as well now next up then um, is uh, Helen O'Donnell now Helen you have uh, an impressive um, title on on screen it's gone off screen now but uh, I took Doctoral Research in Neurodiversity and High Performance Sports. So tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, yes. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, yeah, it's great to be invited along. Thank you. Yes, so I'm currently researching for a PhD on uh, the lived experiences of neurodivergent athletes in high performance sports. So at the moment, I've been um, speaking with uh, lots of athletes who've retired out of sport and then I'll be hoping to have conversations with athletes who are currently competing. My interest in this very under-researched area is not least because I work in sport education so I work at the University of Central Lancashire um, in Preston in Lancashire and so the sport education it includes disability sport as well but also because of my background in psychology and as an educator um, I've a long interest in this area. Um, I my early career as as a teacher was working with autistic children. So my my interest has evolved, and it's interesting when we talk about expertise. I think when when I was younger and working in that area, I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm an expert. I'm doing training for families and and other you know education authorities. Whereas actually, I've, I feel like there's there's quite a shift in in what I feel now, and it's very much about the lived experience I I'm not someone who has well I'm that I know of I'm not someone who has um neurodiversity but I'm I'm very interested in in that athlete voice yeah. because there's very little of it little of it out there fabulous uh, thank you very much Helen and you, you spoke there about athlete voice and uh, that brings us to our next guest quite nicely and that's uh that's that's Cara McMurty um, now you've got a really interesting background in really what you would call high performance um, as a sports person, and also you set up your own charity off the back of it. So um, a really interesting background when it comes to this area. Yeah. So um, 
Hi everyone. I actually recognize some of the names in this call. Sorry if you keep seeing my face um, banging on about neurodiversity and sport. It's, uh, it's my new special interest. Um, so my name is Cara. I was what well, I am a former Great Britain rower. Um, so I was on the Great Britain rowing team for 10 years. Prior to that, I was quite a successful junior and under 23 athlete. So I started rowing through uh, probably not really traditional means um, through a, an outreach project that aimed at getting more state school kids into the sport. Um, and I guess what I would attribute to be my natural kind of autistic tendencies when I was allowed to express them in, in the way that I wanted to, um, in the way that benefited my sport, I ended up kind of taking myself to the junior worlds, under 23s and meddling at both. Um, when I got onto the national team, quite frankly, I really struggled to fit the mold and um, I really wasn't able to do things in, in the way that uh, worked for me best. Um, and that really impacted my mental health. And I was subsequently misdiagnosed as having bipolar disorder. And I spent five years on very heavy medication. Um, three different types of mood stabilizers and antipsychotics whilst try trying to train and compete on the team and kind of fighting for my place to stay on the team somehow managed to do that um, and it wasn't until quite a late kind of intervention with the, the UK sport mental health panel that I was re-diagnosed as autistic and which I guess was a bit of a shock but then when I put the pieces together I, I was like okay yeah it makes sense um, I think the shock came from the fact that there's there's so many negative stereotypes around that label and I didn't see myself in that. Um, and that's part of the reason why after retiring from sport, um, I set up Neurodiverse Sport, which is CIC, so a not-for-profit organisation to really try and to combat these stereotypes and these assumptions. Uh, I was just listening to the other ladies speak I really agree with everything they said. And I think the key is, is that, you know, it's in the name neurodiversity. There, there's just so much diversity in people's brain function and behavior. And, and I think going forwards, the way that we're going to be benefit everyone best is to really have a person centered approach. So that's really what I promote when, when I talk to kind of teams, clubs and organizations, sometimes they want to know like, what is autism? What do we do for an autistic athlete? What is ADHD? What do we do for an athlete in ADHD, with ADHD? And I kind of say, well, it's different for everyone. And there are some common themes, but ultimately, if we enable ourselves to communicate with a more diverse range of people and to have more in our toolbox, then we are going to enable more people. And we're also going to prevent pretty terrible safeguarding mishaps from happening as well, which I would say it's in my case, but if you look at kind of like the gymnastics white review and things like that. So um, there's kind of two prongs to it. I think it's gonna prevent, you know, the not so great things happening. And then it's gonna really promote um, performance because some of the best athletes, some of the world's greatest athletes are neurodivergent. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about me. And that's actually uh, quite interesting, Cara, because at this point in the round table, what we'd ask someone to do is define what the issues are or, or what the, the, the statement is or whatever the sort of definition is. Can you define what neurodiversity is? Can you define what you know inclusivity is or, or racism or whatever it might well be, depending on the theme? But do you think that one of the issues is we try and label people and put people in boxes and that's kind of held back um, being able to move forward in this area? Yeah, partly. Um, I do think there is a place for labels because it, you know, for some people, it, it gives them firstly p permission to be different. And I said that about myself, um, but it also gives them like rights and representation in, in law. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have labels, but we don't live in an ideal world. Um, so I think I think it's it's something to aspire to, but I think it's almost like we need to use labels, but with a caveat of that that's not 
I, I kind of describe it as the label takes you to a place in the library and this library is massive in my head and there's there's rows and rows of books it takes you to a place in the library and then you have to kind of pick what books apply to you or the person that you're working with um so yeah yeah it's, it's just it's an interesting sort of element of, of what we're talking about to, yeah. today um because obviously you, you sort of everyone's always keen to label because then it means you can sort of break people down into certain behaviors etc so i think it's a good place to start is just um Normally, as I say, we would probably try and sort of define what the issues are, etc. Um, but what might be a good and interesting place to start here is, is is talking about how sports and sports clubs can become more uh, inclusive to, to people who are uh, suffering from neurodiversity um, conditions. And maybe I'll come to you first, um, Lucy, for for that question. Uh, you know, what sort of physical steps can and um, steps can clubs and sports take? Well, I kind of think I do sort of backtracking a bit Simon I do think it is important for us to just be clear now in our conversation about what we're talking about um, because not everybody's familiar with the language um, and what neurodivergence includes what that means I absolutely agree with Cara you know it's it's um with all kind of mental health conditions all kinds of um learning differences they are just names for um, shared collections of kind of traits or differences or symptoms. Um, so, you know, they are just, they're useful as guides, but they don't define a person. But I, and, and also there's quite a lot of disagreement and discussion about what is included in um, neurodivergence. So to clarify, you know, neurodiversity Basically, we are all neurodiverse. That just means that our brains are um, develop a little bit differently. We all have different traits and strengths. When you're neurodivergent, it means that you are a bit more different to the majority of people. OK, so I'm left handed. Now, that is a neurodivergence because the minority of the population are left handed. OK, but that doesn't mean I have a disability. Um, it just means I've got that difference. So when we talk about neurodivergence, different people include different conditions, actually. And, and this is a whole topic in itself. So what we're kind of talking about here today, I guess, are the, the common labels that we come across, like autism, like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, dyslexia, dyspraxia, which is also known as developmental coordination disorder. Um, there's other things like dyscalculia. Some people would include cerebral palsy. You know, you can you can expand it and go on. So this is where we that's a starting point. And sometimes the language is just useful as a tool so that we can talk about things. Um, you know, they're kind of shortcuts in a way. Um, but absolutely, I would agree with Cara that we need to just think about everybody as individuals you know we, we need to be person-centered and my experience of neurodivergence is through working with hundreds and hundreds of different clients and they're all different and all have different needs um so in terms of sports clubs you know I think it is useful to gain a little bit of understanding about what these kind of collections of traits um are so you know someone with ADHD tends to have problems with attention um maybe impulsivity and hyperactivity and things they they may have so that may cause a particular collection of problems um the labels are useful in terms of people getting support okay in terms of the way our health services run the way our benefit services run unfortunately people need labels in order to access formal sources of support which you know that has positives and negatives Cara's story is not unusual of being missed out or diagnosed so we need to be really careful not to start labeling people just because we think they seem a bit autistic or they seem a bit ADHD or whatever that's not up to us but what we can do is talk to individuals and find out you know, it's more like spotting, is somebody in your club struggling with certain elements of the sport or the way that training is run or the environment, you know, and, and talking to them, being open to talking about those needs. 
So I don't know if that answers your question, Simon, mm. but it's kind of just a starting point. It was very much a suitably a large question to ask at this point. How do we solve the issue? That's a yeah. classic question, isn't it? Because <laughs> you touched on this as well, Carl, that sort of person-centred approach. And I know, I'm not sure if you do uh, training, I know you do some education within your, your charity. So can you just sort of t t talk to us a little bit about how, how clubs and sports can ensure that they are putting the person at the centre of their approach rather than maybe the label or, or whatever else it might be that they're, they're doing at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it definitely does start with awareness and a true understanding and probably challenging assumptions and stereotypes. And like Lucy said, using a label as a guide um, and just asking questions. Um, and I think of it like you're coming from kind of two in, in terms of communication, like communication is the key to understanding, but seeing it is you're coming from kind of two, two different places and you have to try and meet in the middle, um, really understanding, understanding that and thinking about how you can meet that person halfway. So whether that be thinking about the environment, for example, um, understanding that person might not know what they need, but if you want to go on that learning journey with them, put them at ease, make sure they don't feel like they're in trouble or they've done something wrong, make sure the environment isn't really distracting and that they feel like they can trust you and they can talk to you. And, you know, they're not, I think a big thing in sport, I know we're not just talking about high performance sport, but a big thing in high performance sport is people don't want to talk about what they struggle with because they're worried about the consequences. So I think real, paying real consideration to that and making sure people explicitly understand, look, I'm not going to use this as a stick to beat you with. I appreciate that you're here, even though you're kind of secretly dealing with all of this stuff. Like imagine how good you could be if I helped you with that and kind of get them to really I say get them to trust you, but be trustworthy as well. Don't just get them to trust you. You're not actually going to be on their side. But yeah, it's about it's about going part way and really trying to understand and building environments in which people feel psychologically safe, I would say, is probably the start. And do you think there's um not only, as you said, in sort of elite performance and right down to grassroots, but do you think there's a stigma in place at the moment that stops people coming forward to ask for help i think that's probably in, in many sort of guys especially within sport i mean that would especially high performance like you said but i can imagine that is a major issue yeah absolutely it's 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 different between the different conditions i'd say the most mm. stigmatized is autism i would just say it how it is i think partly that's because i think partly it's because with something like adhd people assume that there is a treatment or a cure and even that's not necessarily the case. Someone doesn't just take a tablet and suddenly they don't have ADHD. Um, but yeah, with, I think with autism, there's this kind of stereotype of somebody's different, they're difficult, they're less than. And I, I definitely get a lot of like the, the way that the two are approached, mm. um, is very different. So I, I might get like a lot of athletes sort of secretly come to me and say, thank you for what you're doing. This has filled me with confidence. I haven't told my coach, I'm not ready to tell my coach. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that. And it's such a shame because these athletes are on Olympic teams. Um, yeah. But they're, they're, they're not telling their coaches or if they do tell their coaches, their coaches then tell them not to tell anyone else because it's something to be ashamed of. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, I'm, 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 if I'm anything, I'm honest. So you asked me a question that's and good. I answered you very Honest, honestly, that's, that's honesty, the situation. Honesty is always a good thing. I think in these situations, isn't it as well? And, um, Helen, if you come to you at this, uh, this point as well, in, in your sort of research, have you found sort of, um, evidence of particular approaches for, for sports to, to, to make themselves more inclusive uh, and accessible in these, in these, in this area? Yeah, I mean, certainly the the research more broadly, I would say that um, it, there is a shift. But I think the more that, you know, once I started researching this, the more you look, the more you will find. However, you know, in terms of 
traditionally it's still it's still very under researched and and there's not enough so if you look and i know we've we might have people from ngbs on here um if, if you look at sort of traditional training or coach education badges etc uh, even even you know degrees um the amount on disability more broadly which is huge and that doesn't necessarily overlap with uh, neurodivergence etc um, but the training is very, very limited. I, I think if I could just go back to to mm. what you're saying about sort of you know that raising awareness, I, th I think there's people need to appreciate that they need to you know why should I raise awareness about this? Why why is it important to us and our club, etc. Um, and I think you know sport is is just a system in society. So it, it mirrors what is happening in society and, and, and more nuanced. And certainly we're talking about high high performance sports, certainly. And we could argue that actually it's quite a toxic culture in certain situations. So as Cara mentioned before, quite rightly, you know, I, I don't want to disclose that I'm neurodivergent. I don't want to disclose that I'm autistic for many, many years as, you know, a child in education, um, you know that shame, that stigma that stigma that you mentioned. So to suddenly expect people to start saying, you know, I'm neurodivergent, I'm dyslexic, etc., is 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 a huge step. And um, thanks to people like Cara who are really championing that now. That that's where we can see those changes. But it will it will take a long time. So baby steps. But it, it's great that these sort of forums yeah. are here to talk about it. Yeah, and we were um, sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's okay, hun. Um, now we were we were doing some work recently for England rugby and went around to the clubs and spoke about inclusivity across many themes. But one of the key things that came out of that was leadership and having sort of a diverse board because obviously what we tend to have at NGB level and um, club level as well is people making decisions who maybe don't have the lived experiences and are basing their decisions for a sport or for a club on stereotypes on what they they think they know about people or that they know about certain conditions as well so is that an issue as well within sport do you think is it is it something that's hard to get a handle on though Helen you know within that it's, it's possibly a lot easier to say well you, you've got a diverse board in relation to culture or nationality or um you know certain backgrounds like that it's possibly more difficult to get a handle on what the picture is in this in relation to uh uh neurodivergent uh, members of boards um, yes and no. Yes, in that, you know, if we look at the boards and we know even in terms of gender balance, in terms mm -hmm. of disability balance, in terms of ethnicity, we know that, you know, it's hugely, it, it does not parallel society. Um, and if you're talking about uh, neurodiversity as well, you know, we, we talk about neurodivergence and hidden disabilities. So people might not notice, you know, I've spoke with athletes who, when they've you know tried to go and speak to the coaches and they've been told well you can't be autistic because you don't behave like I, I've worked with some autistic children so I absolutely can't stress enough this notion of um individuality and that person-centered approach that uh, both Cara and, and Lucy have mentioned as well um and and in terms of the board in terms of how people are behaving within organizations in terms of just just what is visible around the place the organization if you if you're promoting you know we've got this this club or this course that's happening who who are the images what, what are the images that are being shared is it is it does it look diverse you know who is on your board does it look do, do, visually diverse as well so you can start to notice actually yeah we're talking the talk and and, and, and we're really inclusive but is is that really the sort of messages that people We'll get, you know, I might want to join your your football club. I'm a wheelchair user, and actually, the information, the flyers that you're sharing, is actually that that doesn't fit who I am. So I I I don't want to join that club. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And there's, there's just, yes, who's that? Sorry, that you, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah that's all right. I just talking. wanted to come in there because um, I I think what uh, just to sort of because I think you're right, Helen, but I also think. We need to be cautious about thinking that we have to have on our on our boards or governing bodies that we have to have a representative from every different um, diversity that there is, um, because that's not possible. Um, and, you know, 
human beings are human beings. And sometimes you get people who are, um, you know, who have a disability or um, who are different, different ethnicity or whatever, who have very, very strong political views about that and who will have an agenda and, and want to push that. So, you know, I think it is important to to have people, a, a diverse range of people sitting in your um, committees and, and boards and things, but not to preference that over having the right people and, and perhaps just, you know, trying to engage more with the communities around you and the, the diverse members of those communities to feed into the processes that you as a, a board or committee are, are involved with so that you're hearing a range of voices because sometimes we do get individuals who will sit on a lot of committees because they have a particular agenda and, and particular voice. Um, you know, and I think that with education, with with talking more to people with differences, all of us can become more inclusive and more understanding and more supportive and effective. Um, so I just sort of, I guess it's just a little caveat. I, I hope you don't mind, Helen, if that is, you know, makes sense in terms no, of what you're saying. Not at all. And of course, that would come down to recruitment and selection, wouldn't yeah. it? The, the right yeah. person and based on the needs analysis of the organisation. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you. We've, we've got a couple of questions coming in, which I'll touch on in a moment. But this, um, we, we did have a, a question come in before the session. Uh, maybe this is something uh, for you, Cara, as well. Is it's around education, and and we've already spoken a number of times about the need for education. We know education is is key uh, when it comes to uh, all sort of fact, facets of of EBI. But the question here, which I think many people are probably kind of uh, agree with is that volunteers don't always have the time or money to do bolt-on courses after obtaining their main sports qualifications and we, we've already spoken about budget and money so should this training and it's, oh, we'll all probably say yes to this but this should be should it should become core of of any kind of coaching program and uh, intro to coaching or whatever the coaching pathways may be called in different sports should should training you know on this uh, particular subject become mandatory really to everyone involved in sports yeah I mean like a hundred percent it baffles me that it's not and I guess the reason that I say that is because as Lucy kind of explained at the start like we are all neurodiverse so it to me education on, on neurodiversity and how everyone thinks perceives the world differently communicates differently is only going to benefit every single person in your team it's going to benefit communication, it's going to benefit understanding, it's going to benefit performance, um, not just the people who, you know, the 20% on one end of the scale. I think if I see it, um, I like to see things as visuals, if I see it as a visual, the way the systems that we construct, especially in sport, they work really, really well for 20% of people. And there's like 60% of people in the middle who just I say bumble along, <laughs> they kind of get along. They can just about stretch to fit into that system. And then there'll be 20% of people at the other end who no matter how hard they try, because they are that neurodivergent, they just can't stretch to fit. But that, that's 80% of people that could actually benefit from more inclusive practice. Um, mm. So I absolutely think that it should be embedded into uh, curriculums. Um, and coach coach education like 100 percent and I, I don't know if uh, helen or lucy want to come in about this but there's no doubt in my conversations with a range of different sports that making something mandatory makes such a difference to uptake because we're all busy everyone's busy and you know you've got a coach who's got you know dropping the kids to 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 swimming and then cooking uh, a meal and it, it's it, life is extremely sort of busy and often unfortunately people will want to make a change and want to improve but unfortunately people will, will pull back when it comes to to doing training because um they see that you know they're often volunteers and there's there's a lot to do uh, in life so making things mandatory is is also core cool, isn't it to uh, moving forward car you got your hand up i think sorry i just wanted to say like some of the best coaches that i've ever had no in fact all of the best coaches that i've ever had have been volunteers um and i think it it like doesn't cost money to 
educate yourself or to be like a good person and to be emotionally intelligent um and yeah i think i just wanted to say that like perhaps because volunteers are drawn to be volunteers because they have that empathetic side to them i don't know but there's definitely that that crossover well, over to you lucy you've got your hand up as well there i think yeah i i I just like to say as well that you know it doesn't really have to be like a a, a very in-depth or or formal training you know i'm um, just from personal experience you know i've helped um autistic um kids and and adults assess sports and i've just acted as that link of like i've been the person who's been able to go they, you know, my client trusts me, the person trusts me, I go with them to meet the sports coach and have a chat and explain that this person, you know, they are, they're a bit different. They really struggle with certain things and they're really anxious about trying a new sport. And my experience every time is that the coach, the person who's, whether it's a gym instructor or a karate trainer, um, you know, someone running a football club, they're all, they've all been really open to that and have been like, oh, okay. And once you, once they know that this person has some struggles um, and that it's okay to ask them about them and it's okay to have a chat about what would be helpful and stuff, usually then the coaches or the volunteers are really receptive and welcoming and help and helpful. And it's almost like a bit of fear that I think some some coaches or, or volunteers have that if it's something they're not familiar with, you know, if you just announce that, oh, such and such coming and they're autistic and you need to support them, the person might panic and think, oh, my God, I'm supposed to know about this and do certain things. Whereas if it's more just relaxed and just like actually just meet this person and we'll have a chat about some of the things that are difficult um, and some of the things you could do to support. And, um, you know, that can create this really nice sense of, of safety and trust. And I think that is the biggest thing. I think um, mm. both Cara and Helen mentioned before that if you can make people feel safe, then we all perform at our best, don't we? So if you're, if you're, if you can trust the people that are leading the session, and you feel safe in the environment. You'll get a lot more out of it. And as you said, confidence is such a, a key thing. And people tend to pull back from um, uh, doing something really often if they don't feel confident about it. And they'll maybe be quiet and mumble or, you know, and it doesn't quite work that way. Helen, I think it's uh, over to you now. Yeah, thank you. You, you mentioned, Simon, about mandatory training. I, I don't know about you. When we have mandatory training at work, it's... Actually, how much gravitas does it have? And is it a, a tick box exercise? And I'm not I'm not saying, you know, this is nuanced, obviously, and there's different elements. Absolutely, there should be much more awareness, whether that's training, formal training, just on the job, having those conversations. And as Lucy and Carr have both, you know, mentioned the sorts of things that, that can be done. I think I think the other thing as well, you know, volunteers, there's so many different drivers and motivations as to why people choose to volunteer. So Maybe the sport that, that the sport that they love and they've worked in for many years, maybe their own experiences, maybe, you know, again, in terms of actually rather than them being trained, they may be new neurodivergent and, and be the experts themselves. So it's about building that collective, that group who can support. I think also as well, for somebody volunteering it again in terms of life cycle of why they're volunteering, for some it might be that somebody who's starting out in a career or trying to get into a career. Um, that you know they may they may really welcome that opportunity to develop themselves, and I think you know just in terms of their their self worth and, and and their importance, you know that they are valued. I think that's you know sport more, more than any any other is 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 built on volunteers, and and we wouldn't have the athletes we we have without those volunteers. So hugely important resource and. You know, it's about people feeling valued if that's what they want to do. Definitely the lifeblood um, of the industry. Got a couple of questions here, and this is, um, oh, I, I will come to, I think it's Lynn as well. Lynn, I can see you've got your hand up. Um, so I'll come to you um, in, a, in a moment. Zahir says, and this is, I think he's looking for a bit, a bit of advice on on um, something that's obviously happening to him. 
him at grassroots level, but he says, uh, one of the problems I've come across at my community club is the inability of some, some parents um, accepting their child is different and understanding what sports activity they are capable of taking part in as well. So um, is anyone able to give us a here sort of um, a little bit of advice on that? I think this is a, a really tricky um, situation to be in, but happens a lot. So, um, you know, when kids have difficulties and differences, that can be, it, you know, parents have their own journey um, to go through with that in terms of um, seeing it and, and or accepting it. Um, so, you know, you have to be really careful because it's quite, you know, with, without sort of being really knowledgeable and stuff, it, you know, it, we would absolutely say, you know, you mustn't start saying, oh, your child, I think your child's autistic or I think your child's got this issue or that issue because it's not, you know, it's not your place to do that clearly. And I don't think so. He's saying that. Um, but I think what, what you can do is give some feedback about what the child enjoys and what their strengths are. And maybe for you to have a think about what might suit the kid better have you get, got any ideas about um elements of the support that the sport you're you're training you know the kid the child in um are the things that actually they are really good at and and um are better in um and perhaps you know so, so to to talk to the parents from that more of a strengths-based approach of you know i can see that there are these skills and and he or she enjoys this or that but you know they they don't seem as happy doing these activities I wondered if you thought about other sports for them or what else might be suitable and just to try and open up that conversation um possibly i don't know if anyone else has got any thoughts on that oh we got one from lynn lynn i'll bring you in at this point it seems like the optimum time to do it no, thanks, thanks. I, I think the key thing is keep focusing on ability here and keeping it positive rather than focusing on disability or any negatives around it. And, and that really comes into that welcoming and inclusive environment that Cara spoke about. Um, for me, I think, you know, that, that an, an attitude and mindset is, is really key here in terms of flipping that. And sometimes parents won't tell you because they then feel that their child might get, you know, turned away from the club or they become anxious about their inclusion within the club. So it's just something to be mindful of. But something that we promote is just around, if a child is coming to your club, then pick up the phone before they actually come to, to initiate conversation with the parent or the child or, you know, whoever is responsible, that can have the, the main contact to say, you know, what, what are the key things we need to consider? So, so we're really trying to be proactive around, you know, what are there any triggers? Now, I'm not an expert in this area, but I'm just trying to encourage the practice that we're, we're trying to uh, promote um, so that you find out a wee bit more, you know, if there are loud noises, do they need ear defenders, for example, that, that kind of situation. And I guess a key message is if the, the mandatory, mandatory courses scare me a wee bit because then you coaches may then go into a prescriptive mode rather than that participant centered mode and think that if you know all people with autism are the same or all people who are neurodivergent are the same and it's about having that relationship with the parent having that relationship with the child or the adult and building that trust exactly as Cara says and not making assumptions because you've been on a course and and, uh, and you've heard that people with autism may trigger mm -hmm. with this rx by or z so i think the the, the communication is key for me, some wee nuggets, gold bits of gold that I learned were the six second drill generally for anybody and me, I need six seconds to process, but it's a wee nugget around that six seconds and allowing people to process within six seconds. And if somebody's really struggling with eye contact, then go beside them, go side by side rather than face to face. Um, and these are kind of crucial wee, wee bits of top tips that that, um, that we can encourage our coaches to do. But I think, you know, what Cara said and what everybody else is saying is around developing the relationship, communication is key, having that participant-centred approach, not making assumptions and, and having a, a, a very open mindset around and focusing the ability of the individual. Excellent. Thanks very much, Lynn. Really great. Great to hear what you're up to as well and uh, what you put into practice. Um, and Cara, you had your hand up, you don't now, so I'm not sure whether you do want to jump in or not. Yeah, I really agree with what Lynn said. It's because it's a really hard one to mm. answer. And I was 
kind of tossing and turning how I say what I want to say. Um, so apologies if it comes out in a, not the right way, but I guess I would assume that if the child is there, that they want to be there and they want to do the sport. And in my opinion, there is a solution to every problem or difficulty. And so if there's the will of the child to do the sport, that there's going to be a solution to enable them to do it. Because, I mean, you kind of see like, I mean, I've, I went and visited wheelchair fencing world championships the other day and like, yes, a person who is in a wheelchair wouldn't be able to fence in the traditional sense. So they created sit down fencing. So that's just an analogy, but is there a way that you could adapt the sport or the activity to suit that person better? And then who knows, other people might enjoy that better too. Um, but I don't know, maybe that's just not, that example is not applicable to the question because there's not loads of detail about um the exact situation yeah but that's what i would always endeavor to i i feel i feel really bad when people just get essentially just get pied off to different to somewhere else or other sports um i think activity alliance did some research on uh so whether dis, uh those, so they sent research out to like um a huge cohort of disabled people um and they asked would you prefer to participate in mainstream sport or disability sport so a separate sport for disability and it was something like 70 something percent said mainstream sport so i just i don't know i just imagine how that would feel f to be told oh you can't do this so you should find somewhere else to go um, yeah i i think what you're saying is really important cara and because the other point is that you know people do sport for all sorts of different reasons and they're not necessarily doing it because they want to be good at it so, you know, um, I remember um, uh, working with um, a girl who was autistic, who was one of a twin, and they both did karate. And I went to some sessions with them. And one twin who was who was not autistic was um, excelled. She was really good. And the one who was not who was autistic found it really difficult. She needed a lot more processing time. Uh, she struggled with um, knowing her left from her right and coordinating her movements. So, she, you know, if you were to compare them in terms of their performance, there was a big difference. But they both enjoyed the karate as much as each other. And although the one child really struggled and it was clear, you know, it was it was hard for her. She got a lot out of it and she wanted to keep coming and she enjoyed it. Um, and so it was about supporting her at her level of performance. So and I think that's a really important thing with children because, you know, I do despair a bit at the attitude of, you know, you can only do certain sports if you're good at them and a lot of kids at schools get left behind because they're not really sporty and the attention goes on the high you know the high performers I was one of those kids who was really not great at sport but I wanted to be involved and a lot of kids they you know there's enough enjoyment and pleasure out of just engaging with the sport mm. even if they really struggle and I think that's what's it's really important to remember that and to let people do things because they want to and because they enjoy it not because they have the ability. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Lucy. Dom, I think you got your hand up there. Dom, do you want to come in at this point? Where have you gone? Oh, there you are. Hey, guys. Um, I operate in, in a team sport environment, and um, it probably sits somewhere between high performance and semi-pro. And I was just wondering if anyone had any advice around... Um, creating that environment in a team situation because I guess it's easier to tailor things um, when you're working with individual athletes. If, if however, you've got a group of 25 people um, and the session is something that they're all taking part in and, and they're, all, they're all doing the same thing, it's far harder to create something that, that perfectly suits everybody. Yes. I mean, I suppose mm -hmm. the the... The crux goes back to that you coach the person first um, and the the athlete second. 
but uh, I guess everyone in the room's got far more um, experience of it than I have. So I just wondering if any of that had any views on how to how to do that as as well in a team environment as you yeah. can with individual athletes. People sort of person centered approach, but within that team environment, which can be difficult, can't it? When you're you're, you're working with twenty five individuals as well, Cara. I know you spoke about um, you know, you you from your background, um, you got your hand up, so I'm I'm sure yeah. you've got some advice for Dom there. I appreciate that we don't have loads of time either, though, so I'm just going to put the bits of advice out there. <laughs> so I think first and foremost, creating that environment where people feel safe to come to you, maybe in a break time um or around training so they can say hey like i maybe i need to see this visually like in between time you you say things really quickly and um it kind of i don't have time to process it it would really help if you pointed at things or if you drew it on a board um or if you potentially gave that option um you know if people need a bit more time and a bit more explanation as well because sometimes it is that it's as simple as that you know, whilst you're walking to the pitch, um, whilst everyone else is doing their warm up, you can like, normalize just giving tiny bits of time, a minute, two minutes, five minutes to people where as and where they need it. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, and this kind of counted more for like probably the younger groups of individuals. Um, but if you see someone getting kind of ribbed for being different or being slow or needing more explanation, just nip it in the bud and just be like, right, that's really immature. Like they're just trying to improve their performance, like get over it. And like people will kind of follow your example and they'll kind of, it will slowly start to normalize that difference and normalize people um, advocating for themselves safely. Sorry, that was like real whistle stop. <laughs> Yeah, you look at the top right of the clock thinking, blind. yeah. You could go on. This is always the way with these roundtables. You could continue for as long as you want to almost because these topics are so vast, aren't they? So it is just a, a case of sort of dropping some ideas in there and hopefully that conversation will continue after um, the session. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on that bit, Lucy or uh, Helen, or we'll pop on to the, go on to the next question? I think Cara said it beautifully. I think it is about just, just ask and, and have that environment and culture where people are able to feel that there's, there's the trust there so yeah I mean, what's coming out of this is people-centered communication is key isn't it and that's what we've got from zoe hi zoe um she's sent in a couple of messages saying people-centered approach is key having as much information about people's needs and uh, that that aids a smooth transition and goes on to say there is issues around budget and clubs but i suppose communicating doesn't cost anything which mm. is something that, Carl, you touched on previously, isn't it, as well? That, um, you know, that there doesn't need to be a budget to be able to speak to people in a positive way. Sorry, Zoe, I thought you took yourself off off mute there to say something, but... Sorry, I, uh, yes, I did. Ah. Um, apologies. Um, yeah, I think sometimes it's not such a bit a massive barrier as you may first think. I think communication mm. is key. And it could just be that if the club has got limited resources, i.e. staffing or volunteers, just some pre-planning could help somebody attend. And that could be pre-planning around visuals being sent out or emailed out to that individual or the family. Mm -hmm. And that could sort of make or break that person attending and that transition into a club. It could be something as simple as that, not, not as scary as perhaps some club deliverers perhaps think think of it as being a massive problem it could just be a conversation um and a visual timetable or even a breakdown of what will happen at that club and then a parent could interpret that into a visual timetable for a young person yeah, communication yeah. certainly key yeah great and i think sometimes people within the sector are guilty of making of making it out to be a much bigger problem sometimes or a big mountain to overcome and and like you said sometimes there is a way of simplifying it yeah no um, I... car sorry go on sorry no it's okay Zoe. <laughs> that's fine thank you very much for your input and Cara, you had your hand up um just to add a little bit to that maybe or was that just a button oh, press? I know I didn't mean to <laughs> I was just playing with the reactions because I wanted oh, right. to give Zoe a like woo uh... but because <laughs> I thought that was a really uh, important thing that she said it's like sometimes it's literally the smallest thing mm. that can yeah. make such a massive difference so 
but thank you. There we are. So we got the thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, was, some... I would agree with that. And I was just okay. looking at the chat because um, mm -hmm. uh, Helen has put in about, you know, clear rules and expectations, allowing time out if necessary. But but that point that, yeah, things that suit people who are neurodivergent often suit other people in the in yeah. the team or the club as well. And, and I think, you know, just reinforcing what Kyra said is, you don't need to be experts you just literally and even it's even better just to say you know I guess if you phone up and and you're saying are oh, you joining the club and the person says yes but I'm autistic you say oh I don't really know much about that what what would that what does that mean for you you know and just have that mm. chat it's like people like it if you're more honest and ask questions what they don't like is if you make out you know what you're doing and you make assumptions and 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 then sort of dictate and generalize you know so yeah. it is really about yeah that communication yeah it's crucial uh, great and um we are about to we'll, we'll do our sort of final thoughts in a minute and i might come to cara helen and lucy for that final sort of 10 second soundbite you know what we can do leaving here now what's the best thing we can do now put into practice and go away with it is one thing so there we are no pressure um but Carly says that there is, I'm, and I have to apologise to people we haven't been able to get to because um, of time, but Carly says, is there any training out there that you would recommend to sports clubs for broadening their understanding of awareness? Um, and Lucy, you've responded to that, I can see. Um, but he goes on to say, when considering a person-centred approach, etc. And obviously, we um, this is where we just mentioned, once again, that we work with Lucy to create uh, this online course. And I think it's all, when, when it comes to EDI as well, there's those possibilities of having webinars so you can tailor the learning a bit. Um, from what is in the course too but um, that resource will be available in the next couple of weeks and, and everyone here will will be able to to get their hands on it for 20% for off as well as a sort of thank you for coming along um, today as well um, but we've only got a, a few minutes left so who wants to go first um, as a kind of final thoughts moment for people to leave with I, okay. I think you, you oh. mentioned there, Simon, didn't oh. you? Oh, go on. So, Cara, go on. <laughs> this always happens. Everyone starts together. <laughs> like, I literally how everyone went at the same time. I was just going to literally say something as simple as um, try to be as emotionally intelligent as possible. Um, there are different types of empathy, and empathy, cognitive empathy, can be learned. Think about how you would feel in someone else's situation um, and start from there. Fabulous. Thank you, Cara. Yeah, um, go over to you now, Helen. Yeah, thank you. I think just to say, if you feel like there is a need, and I guess by the fact that all these people have joined this call, they feel that they want to do something, maybe make some changes, um, look around you and, you know, who's doing what in your local area. But also, and really importantly, we have the beauty of the internet and, you know, people like Cara and her business that she set up in terms of neurodiversity sport and, you know, her experiences and also the the athletes that, um, you know, she's she's been working with and, and, and really championing the the, the strengths of, of neurodivergence in, in sport, certainly. But, yeah, there is plenty of information out there. Once you start looking, you will find lots, but certainly lived experience is key. Hmm. Yeah, I absolutely agree with everything you both said. Um, and also Liz has put in the chat about, you know, as coaches um, delivering, just basically learning about uh, or understanding the different learning styles that that we all have um, mm. and, and trying to create variety to meet all those different needs and, and talk to people talk to you know you will be you will be um in contact with coaching or know people who are neurodivergent whether they're diagnosed or not it doesn't matter chat to people about their experiences and their needs um and that's the best way to learn i think yeah 